Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. I have with me in the studio today Dr. Stephen Phillips, author of the new book Silver Lining, which is an investigation into UFOs. Now, Dr. Phillips, can you tell us a little about your book? Yes, certainly. Over the last 12 years, I've become increasingly interested in the subject of UFOs, and this book is a compilation of all the sightings I've heard about, together with evidence. You see, so many people are convinced that there is life on other planets that I thought I would do some research myself. And what did you find? Are we alone in the universe? <laughs> you sound sceptical. Well, you'll have to buy the book to find out my personal conclusion, but I can tell you this. There are a lot of sightings in a number of different countries, and the surprising fact that I have found is that despite never having met each other, a great number of these witnesses describe an almost identical object. Now, I realize that television and the media has given us all a mental picture of a UFO, a silver ship with bright lights that moves at very high speed. What interested me was that in all the eyewitness accounts I heard, people gave very precise and detailed descriptions that varied only slightly. Reports from America, Europe, even Asia, all share a significant number of similarities. Hmm, interesting. Tell me, have you been able to see any evidence yourself? Well, no. My aim in writing this book was not really to present my own opinion, but to gather all the information available and collate it into a kind of reference guide. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. The second chapter of my book actually talks about a place in America that has often been in the media, Area 51. Area 51? Yes, it's a military base in New Mexico. In 1947, a man called McBrazel claimed... Sorry, who? McBrazel. That's M-A-C, capital B, R-A-Z-E-L. Anyway, McBrazel claimed to have found pieces of an alien spacecraft on his farm in Roswell. Now, many people believe that this was true and that the government of the time took the debris. Since that time, they have denied all knowledge of any such find and accounts by the many leading experts at the time dismissed the claim believing that McBrazel had actually found pieces of a higher altitude weather balloon that had disintegrated. Now the lack of information combined with a large number of conspiracy theorists means that no useful scientific conclusion can be drawn but I have found out one or two surprising details. Again, you'll have to buy the book if you want to find out more. Okay. Now, I understand that an overwhelming majority of UFO sightings occurred in America. Do you find that in any way relevant? Well, as I mentioned before, there are a large number of conspiracy theorists, and the popularity of science fiction programs in America could lead you to suspect that these sightings may be nothing more than an overactive imagination. However, I have found that there are a number of other factors that determine UFO sightings. In Northern Europe, the number of reports is very low, whereas in Southern Europe, where there is more open space, less light pollution, and generally clearer skies, the number of sightings increases. 
Now, when you consider the vast open areas of America, particularly around New Mexico, there is an argument that UFOs are simply easier to see in certain geographical and climatic situations. Hmm. Well, I've never thought of that. If I could ask you one final question, Dr. Phillips, what about alien abduction? Ah, well, I don't really cover that in my book. You see, I was looking to present facts from which people could draw their own conclusions. With these reported abductions, I've found them to be very unreliable. Well, thank you very much for your time. Before we finish, I'd just like to add that Silver Lining is available at all leading bookstores, priced at £19.99. Until next week, goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a teacher helping high school students visiting from an overseas school to fill in a school excursion permission note. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Good morning, students. My name is Mrs Brown, and I'm in charge of the school excursion next week. Please take out your school excursion permission note so you can fill it in. For insurance purposes, this note must be signed by your guardian or the group leader. First of all, fill in the name of your class. Everyone here is in 3A, aren't they? So write 3A where it says class. We're going to the Blue Mountains, which is great. So this is the school excursion to the Blue Mountains. The day we leave is Monday. That's Monday, June 10. We are travelling by bus all the way, so we don't have to worry about changing trains or anything like that. The bus will leave from the front gate at 8 a.m. I know we usually use the side gate, but because of the roadworks, we will be using the front gate when we leave. However, when we return, the roadwork will be complete, so we'll use the side gate. We expect to be back at 6pm. It's going to be a lovely day. Your teachers will give you tasks to do when we arrive. We'll provide fruit and fruit juice on the bus, but you must bring your own lunch. While we're on the excursion, We'll be moving around a lot in some fairly rough country. Be very careful to wear strong shoes. It's very important that you look after your feet very well. Now, does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. No questions? OK. I'd just like to fill in a few more details. The bus should arrive in the Blue Mountains at 11am. We'll have time to do the first of our tasks before lunch. The bus is not a new one, but it does carry one piece of special equipment, a first aid kit. I certainly hope we won't have to use it, but it's nice to know it's there in case we have a medical emergency. The other class on this excursion is 3B, 
so I know it'll be a good day. The last time 3A and 3B went out together was a thoroughly successful excursion. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a business study student called Sam talking to his tutor about an IT project he is going to do for a local company called Turner's. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Hello, Sam. Come in and sit down. Thanks. You're here to discuss your company-based IT project, aren't you? Yes. I've been to see the manager, and he's given me a lot of ideas about projects that the company would find useful. But I wanted to ask your opinion about them before I choose one. Yes, that's fine. Now, this company's called Turner's, isn't it? That's right. It's a small engineering company. They make machine components for trade use. They're well established. They started in 1976, but they're a bit old fashioned. OK. And what kind of projects did Turner's suggest you could do for the company? Well, they want some improvements made to their customer database. Uh, the one that they've got at the moment isn't very useful in some ways. I had a quick look at it. Uh, mm. That would be a very straightforward project, and it'd be simple enough to evaluate, but I don't think you'd get enough out of a project like that. You wouldn't learn anything new. Well, another project they suggested is to do with their online sales catalogue. At the moment, customers can look at their products, but they can't actually order them online, which m must affect their competitiveness. But I said I thought it would take too long. It's quite a big task. You're right. It's too much for the time you've got. It's a pity, though. Then they want some help with their payroll system. At the moment, the way they calculate pay involves a lot of manual accounting. I suggested they could have a system where employees register electronically when they arrive and leave work, so the hours they do could be transferred automatically. Hmm. I think you'd get a lot out of a project like that. It would extend your skills, but it wouldn't be too much to take on. A student did something similar a couple of years ago, but this is slightly different. Hmm. Well, then they need help with their stock inventory. They do everything manually. Really? <laughs> yes, and it takes so much time. Ugh. It's probably very inaccurate, too. An electronic inventory would probably be the biggest single benefit for the company. I'm surprised they haven't had it done before. Oh, I know. Then they wanted to improve their internal security. The manager had visited other companies where the staff use uh, swipe cards to access various areas of the building. It sounded useful, but the trouble is I'm not really sure how to do it. Well, I think you're right in that assessment. At the moment, it's probably a bit beyond your level of knowledge. Is that all? Just one more. Customer service. They want to be able to collect feedback from their customers in a more systematic way. At the moment, it's a bit of a mess, and they probably lose business as a result. Would that involve you going to see customers at their own premises? Because in that case, you might have to do a fair amount of traveling, and that would incur expenses that haven't been agreed with these companies. I never thought of that. Well, it might not be a problem, but it's something that needs clarifying. Well, I hope that's been helpful in narrowing down the options. Yes, it has. Thanks. I'll be able to make a decision now. But while I'm here, can I talk to you about coursework? Sure.
Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. I'm not very happy about the way our group assignment is working. There are some problems. Oh, dear. Are people just not getting on with each other? That's the worst thing. Actually, we're all friends. It's not that. But when we're having a discussion about the assignment, one or two people end up doing all the talking and the rest don't say anything. It's a bit frustrating because we need plenty of debate. Well, that's a common observation. You're studying in a group with people from all over the world, and you all have your own ways of participating. In some places, students are more used to listening than talking, and vice versa. Mm, I suppose you're right. I'll try to remember that. Does everyone pull their weight as far as sharing the workload is concerned? I'd say they do, yes. And our group elected uh, a leader. She's very good at making sure no one's overloaded. But personally, I feel that there are just too many of us in the group. Whenever we try to arrange a meeting, there's always at least one person who can't make it. It's not anyone's fault, it's just that we've all got slightly different timetables. Well, I'm glad you've talked to me about it. Feedback is always useful. Is there anything else you're concerned about? Uh, there are a couple of problems with lecturers that, that all the students are talking about. Hmm. Last semester, we had negative feedback about the way lectures were organized. There were several occasions when the wrong room had been booked or the same room had been booked twice, that sort of thing. Is that still a problem? That hasn't happened at all, as far as I know. Oh, good. It's sorted out then. But I don't know the reason, but some of the staff often turn up late, so we miss 10 or 15 minutes of our lecture time. It might be because they've been copying handouts for students. I think there's a cue for the machine sometimes. Well, I'll look into that. Thank you for telling me. Anything else? <laughs> the other thing is that it can be very difficult to get to see a lecturer individually. They're all very supportive and friendly when you do manage to find them, but often they're not in their office, even at times when they're meant to be available for consultation. Okay, that's helpful. Now, before you leave... Uh, let that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an interview with a marketing director. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Continuing our theme of business marketing, I have with me today Mr. Brian Kinsella, who is here to talk about the differences between marketing a product and marketing a service. Good morning. Now I understand that many of you here today are interested in a career in services marketing. Well, I've been the marketing director for Oceania Travel for nearly 11 years, so I feel that I can present what I consider to be the most important aspects of marketing a service. However, before I begin, I want to clarify what I mean by services marketing. This not only means aspects like holiday destinations, but also professional services such as legal advice. In short, anyone that sells a service. Actually, 
A lot of the traditional services such as lawyers, accountants, etc. have not felt too comfortable marketing their services. It's almost perceived in industries such as these that the need to market indicates a weakness in the services provided. However, more and more such industries are realizing the importance of marketing to sustain their customer numbers, especially when their competitors are marketing themselves. Now, the main difference between marketing a product and a service is that the customers cannot understand exactly what the service will be. They can see a product and can comprehend exactly what the product will do for them. A service is more intangible. By that, I mean whatever each customer gains from the service is often very personal. For example, with a travel agency, clients choose to travel abroad for a multitude of motives. Some people travel overseas for the experience and really want to get to know the culture of the local people. Others wish to escape from reality, totally relax in sophisticated comfort and be waited on hand and foot. Obviously, our clients will not be judging what we offer by the same standards, and travel agents, like other such service industries, have an extremely difficult job in satisfying a range of customers from diverse backgrounds with different expectations. Our company has overcome this dilemma in a number of ways. First of all, our travel consultants are given extensive training in customer service and buyer behavior. Our aim is not just to be a profit-making organization, but also to meet and exceed the expectations or dreams of our clients. Our mission statement, in fact, is primarily to offer a service which is above and beyond the hopes of our clients. In addition, we regularly visit the tourist destinations we promote and inform all of our staff about any changes in specific areas. Not only is it important to be fully informed about every possible aspect of the service you are marketing, it is also essential to constantly improve the service offered. At Oceania Travel, we regularly conduct surveys with all of the people that visit our resorts of choice. Any negative feedback we try to remedy at once. Our clients are met by a company representative during their stay, and we have a set procedure for dealing with any complaints. Our clients are not expected to have to approach the hotel reception, as we have a 24-hour contact service direct to our representatives, and this representative should always welcome any customer problems or questions. In the event of a complaint, the representative will then try to remedy the complaint with the hotel. If the problem cannot be rectified by the hotel manager, our representative is authorized to remedy the situation him or herself. For situations beyond the representative's authority, our complaints department is contacted. The complaints department guarantees a solution within the day. If the customer is still not satisfied, they are welcome to approach our head office on their return. So you see that marketing a service is catering more for the client's expectations than anything else, and it is that which makes services marketing a very intricate business. Now that's the end of my presentation. But if there's anything you want to ask, then please feel free to do so. Thank you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
You're never gonna make it, you're not good enough There's a million other people with the same stuff You really think you're different, man, you must be kidding Think you're gonna hit it, but you just don't get it It's impossible, it's not probable, you're irresponsible Too many obstacles, you gotta stop it, yo You gotta take it slow, you can't be a pro Don't waste your time no more Who the fuck are you to tell me what to do? I don't give a damn if you say you disapprove I'm gonna make my move, I'm gonna make it soon And I'll do it cause it's what I wanna fucking do Cause all these opinions and all these positions They come in in millions, they block in your vision But no, you can't listen, that shit is all fiction Cause you hold the power as long as you're trying to make it there's no way that you make it And maybe you can fake it But you're never gonna make it Are you just gonna take that? Make them take it all back Don't tell me you believe that Are you just gonna take that?